Okay, friends, remember, you did this to yourself. We're gonna talk in blistering speed about metabolism for performance. I know most of you are gonna miss a lot of this, but I don't care. I'm gonna try to ram this out in five minutes or less. In fact, I got a lot less because I'm wasting time right now. If you wanna learn more about this, you're gonna to have to check out the other videos, particularly the long physiology of fatigue or endurance. I'm gonna have some extensive videos on it. So now that we're down to like four minutes, here we go. Okay. When you ingest food, it starts in your mouth. Let's assume we're talking about carbohydrate to start, okay? When that goes in your stomach, it, it, by the time it leaves your stomach, it's no longer a carbohydrate. It is now in the form typically of glucose, which is a six carbon molecule. When it leaves your stomach, it's gonna then enter your blood also in the form of glucose. Now, you will take glucose and you will store it in one of three places, either in the liver as muscle glycogen, in the muscle as muscle glycogen, or a little bit of it, depending on what else is going on, will be stored uh, as adipose tissue. Now this process called de novo lipogenesis is not excessive, so that area was a little bit small. But this depends on a lot of different things. Other videos, okay? Now, if you take fat and you ingest that, say this wonderful piece of cheese, well, that's gonna leave your stomach in the form of a free fatty acid, so it's smaller components. It's gonna then enter your blood, uh, but before that, depending on kind of what you do here, there is a little bit in, in how your stomach can convert fatty acids and glucose back and forth. Um, Google resistant starches if you want to know more about that, particularly how you can turn a f make a fiber actually into a shorter chain fatty acid. But nonetheless, most of the fatty acids will go into the blood that is fatty acid. You'll store those in a handful of places. You can convert some fatty acids into uh, glycogen called the uh, gluconeogenesis, formation of new glucose from non-glucose molecules. Um, but you can store it also in the muscle as IMTG, so this would be intramuscular triglyceride. This is a positive thing and we can use this for endurance performance. Or you can store it as a triglyceride in adipose tissue. Now in terms of protein, that's going to hit your stomach, be digested, and it's going to be uh, moved on as its individual amino acid components, depending on what type of protein you get. Therefore, it's in the blood, it is in an amino acid. In terms of storage, again, you can store a little bit of excess amino acid as a uh, triglyceride, but not, not, not much often. You're most likely going to excrete it if it's waste. You can store some of it, a small amount of amino acids in muscle, which is good because then you can use those amino acids to generate things like muscle cells, immune cells, antibodies, neurotransmitters, hormones, insulin, who knows, who knows what else you can do with it. Okay, and then again, some of that can be converted in uh, through gluconeogenesis as well, but again, we're talking a fairly small amount. Now, I'm a little bit behind time, so I gotta speed up a little bit. <sighs> Here we go. Now, We've got our, our stored energy systems and we're gonna have, in order to get stored energy into the exercising muscle, we gotta put it back in the blood and move it to whatever muscle is being exercised. But let's start actually up the muscle. Now, when you exercise, depending on what you're doing, you're primarily going to use the fuel that is in the exercising muscle. Obviously, this makes more sense. It's right there, it's going to be faster. If I start taking fuel from another organ tissue, I gotta pick it in blood, move it to the body, it's just gonna be a lot slower. So the first thing I'm gonna use is, is carbohydrate that stored muscle glycogen we talked about. We're gonna metabolize that through a process called glycolysis. Lysis meaning to split, glyco meaning glycogen, so glycolysis is the splitting of glycogen. What happens there is we take those six carbon molecules, we split it up into two separate three carbon molecules. We call those things pyruvate. Now, as a result of that, we get a couple of little stars, two to three. Now, those stars are what are called ATB. That's the energy currency of all cells. In other words, that's the only way anything in biology can actually make usable energy. But we only get two to three. It's a very, very small amount. If we have sufficient oxygen available in the tissue, we can take that pyruvate and ship it up in this other blue little circle we call the mitochondria. Anytime you hear the word aerobic or oxidative, uh, you automatically know this is going down in the mitochondria. You notice glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm or cytosol outside of the mitochondria. It's anaerobic. Once we want to go to fully metabolize that carbohydrate molecule, we have to actually take it through aerobic metabolism, metabolism which means we have to ship it to the mitochondria. So we take those two separate three carbon molecules, we then break them down individually into a, a separate two carbon molecules called acetyl-CoA. Now that we went from three carbons, six to three to two, which means we lost one carbon with each one of those conversions. We're gonna take those additional carbons, bound those to those oxygens, make carbon dioxide and go 
and breathe that out. Check out the five, the all of my videos on physiology of fat loss. You want to learn more about that, how the carbon dioxide O2 thing, fat loss thing works. Nonetheless, we take that acetyl-CoA, and during that conversion, we make a couple little more stars, not a big deal. We're going to take that through another little circular process called tricyclic acid cycle, or often known as Krebs cycle in most ex -phys circles. Gives you a little bit of ATP, a couple more CO2, in fact, two CO2 each, and we went from six to three to two to two to zero zero. We're out. Now, as a result of that tricyclic acid we cycle, we make a whole bunch of high energy metabolites or uh, substrates that we can use, or high energy intermediates, excuse me. And as a result of that, we get a bunch more ATP. And that's really how we can generate a lot of ATP. Also, the reason why carbohydrates can be used for both anaerobic and aerobic, right? Because you have to be started anaerobically, finished aerobically to be fully metabolized. In terms of amino acid, that arrow is small. You can use it. It's 100% oxidative, so there's no anaerobic metabolism going on there. If you want to use it for fuel, it's got to be oxidative. Got to ship to the mitochondria. It's got two carbons, so it's going to process similar to acetyl-CoA. It's going to run through Krebs cycle, yada, yada, yada. Going to get more of those stars. In terms of using fat, the first thing you're going to have to do is separate that IMTG into a whole bunch of different categories. So you have the three red ones there in the middle, and those three carbon molecules. Are, are called uh, glycerol. So it's a three carbon backbone. Those other big chains are their fatty acid chains. And, and the length of the fatty acid chains is 12 to 20 ish, depending, right? So it's a lot more potential energy than a, than a carbon or a carbohydrate. First thing we have to do then is ship those glycerols into the tissue of the mitochondria and it run, runs and forms just like pyruvate did. Why? Because it's three carbon molecule. More ATP, more Krebs cycle, etc. In terms of those fatty acids, though, we have to ship them through a little transporter called carnitine. Right? That's actually the rate limiting step to using oxygen, uh, using fat as a fuel. Yeah, it's limited by lipolysis, or sorry, oxidation, not lipolysis, and oxidation is limited by carnitine. Not carnosine, not creatine. Okay, make sure you don't make, make up the difference there. You have these big long then chains of fatty acid. What you're going to do for those is cleave off or cut two carbons at a time. It's in the mitochondria, so it's oxidation. You're cutting one, two at a time, so we call this process, ready, ready, ready? Beta oxidation. Ah, yes, that's what it is. Since you cut two off at a time, you can handle it and process it kind of just like you do acetyl-CoA, run through Krebs cycle, a bunch more ATP. Every time you cut, 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 you get two more uh, carbon molecules, run them more, and you get a whole bunch of ATP because of that. And this is why per molecule, per mole, a single molecule of fat is going to give you much more energy, ATP, than one molecule of carbohydrate. However, it's actually technically less efficient because the stoichiometry, it's not one to one. In other words, you need one oxygen molecule to get one carbon of carbohydrate gone. You need less than that, uh, or a little bit more than that for fat. And so it actually is a little bit less metabolically efficient in terms of per molecule of oxygen, although you get more total ATP. So what that means is we've got pros and cons. Carbohydrate is not better or worse, nor fat is better or worse for metabolism for exercise. They both have their pros and their cons. If it's a speed issue, carbohydrate. If the downside of carbohydrate though is you got limited supply. The benefit of fat, unlimited supply, downside is it's too slow and it's not as efficient, right? Because we only have a little bit of IMTG in the exercising muscle, so we have to go start going outside of the exercising muscle itself to get our fat. Carbohydrate, however, is mostly going to be coming from the muscle glycogen. Once muscle glycogen starts running low, we can start pulling glucose from the blood. That's great. It has to enter through the cell through a GLUT4 transporter, just like carnitine. This is the, the transporter that gets glucose into the cell. Then we run it through glycolysis, no problem. Once blood glucose starts getting low, we start taking glycogen from the liver. Only issue there is what happens when the liver runs out. Mm, problem, because I mentioned earlier, if blood glucose gets too low, brain goes, eh, you go down. Hard to exercise like that. In terms of fat, though, we have a whole unlimited supply, basically, of adipose tissue. We have a bunch of triglycerides, so the, the amount of lipolysis we can do is basically unlimited. We break that stuff down, we attach it to albumin. It has to be transported that way through the blood. We have to get it into the muscle itself through a fatty acid binding protein, FAB, FAB. Right? And this in the form of a long chain fatty acid. Once we get into this tissue, then we have to transport it into the mitochondria via carnitine. And you see how we just have all these additional extra steps. Now, one little note to add there, one of the benefits of medium or short, train, short chain fatty acids is they have to go through fatty acid binding protein, but they don't have to go through carnitine. And this is why these things are very popular for nootropic effects, energy effects, uh, and other things, is because they can slide in the mitochondria and be used much easier for fuel.
Now, in other videos, I'll explain to you then what the metabolic rate limiting step for different types of exercise are, but hopefully that gave you a quick primer and a teaser. We'll be back next time when I got a little more energy. Thanks a lot, hope you enjoyed. Thank you.